we have been privileged over the years to have excellent expositors of God's Word, and this year is no different. Dr. Daniel Block is presently the Gunther H. Nodler Professor Emeritus of Old Testament at Wheaton College. He received his Bachelor of Education and his Bachelor of Arts from the University of Saskatchewan. His MA from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and his Doctor of Philosophy from the University of Liverpool. Dr. Block didn't go to Saskatchewan because it was a great place. It's basically where he's from. And so, <laughs> nothing wrong with Saskatchewan, of course. <laughs> Dr. Block is a native Canadian, having been raised in the home of a Mennonite brethren minister farmer in Saskatchewan. He has spent the last four decades teaching the scriptures in four different institutions. The first one was Providence College beginning in 1973, and then he went to Bethel College in 1983, and then to Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in 1995, and then ended with Wheaton College beginning his ministry there at 2005. In addition, he has lectured and taught classes around the world in countries like Russia, Greece, Kenya, Colombia, China, Singapore, and Australia. Throughout his life, his passion has been to recover for the church the life-giving power of the Old Testament. Dr. Block has authored over 150 scholarly essays as well as numerous popular articles, And his books include The Triumph of Grace, Literary and Theological Studies in Deuteronomy and Deuteronomic Themes. That's his recent publication, 2017. For the Glory of God, A Biblical Theology of Worship, 2014. And Ruth, The King is Coming, 2015. And you'll notice that we have a fair amount of his uh, commentary on Deuteronomy. And uh, if uh, I've understood that if we don't have enough left by the end of the day, uh, the uh, David C. Cook group will end up mailing them out for free, obviously if you pay for them ahead of time. (laughs) Last year, Dr. Block celebrated his 50th wedding anniversary with his wife, Ellen. They have two adult children, Janelle and Jason. They're both married, and these marriages have produced for the blocks six, and this is their words, delightful grandchildren. Dr. Block, thank you very much for coming. Please come and minister to us. The first session is going to be a a sermon, as we usually do, and then the others will be plenary sessions uh, to minister how to preach from Deuteronomy. Are we on? That's the first thing we check. It's a joy to be back home. This is not Saskatchewan, but it is north of the border. And you can tell where your heart is whenever the Olympics are on. And yes, we are Canadian. It's a joy to be with you today to minister in the Word of God, or should we say, to minister the Word of God. I've been asked to deal with the book of Deuteronomy. I prefer to call this book the Gospel according to Moses. And our agenda today is to get some help in preaching the gospel according to Moses. I'm going to start with reading Deuteronomy 14, 1 to 21. This is the word of God. And in Scripture, whenever you hear a word from a superior You stand. God never speaks to anybody in the Bible who is sitting down. 
So let's all rise in honor of God who speaks from his word. And I would request that you not follow along in your Bibles. We are aware that the scriptures were written to be heard, not preached. Oh yes, we do that too, obviously, but that's not their primary function. The scriptures are the sermon that we need to hear. Our sermons are simply silly comments on what is the inspired, authoritative Word of God. And the Scriptures were written to be heard in community. We'll talk about that some more later on. We need to hear the same words from God. We need to hear it aloud. They were written to be heard together. And so, if you follow along in your Bibles, you will be distracted, A, by my inability to read properly, and B, you'll be wondering what kind of translation I'm reading from. All of those are unnecessary distractions. So put your Bibles down, hear the Word of God. Sons you are to the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves nor shave your head for the sake of the dead. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be his people his, as his special possession, treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, you may not eat any detestable thing. These are the animals that you may eat, the ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roebuck, the wild goat, the ibex, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. Any animal that divides the hoof and has the hoof split in two and chews the cud among the animals, that you may eat. Nevertheless, you may not eat of those among those that chew the cud or among those that divide the hoof in two, the camel and the rabbit and the rock badger, for though they chew the cud, they do not divide the hoof. They're unclean for you. The pig, because it divides the hoof but does not chew the cud, it is unclean for you. You may not eat any of their flesh nor even touch their carcasses. These you may eat of all that are in the water. Anything that has fins and scales you may eat, but anything that does not have fins and scales you may not eat. It is unclean for you. You may eat any clean bird, but these are the ones that you may not eat. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the red kite, the falcon, the kite and their kinds, and every raven in its kind, the ostrich, the owl, the seagull, and the hawk in their kinds, the little owl, the great owl, the white owl, the pelican, the carrion vulture, the cormorant, the stork, the heron in their kinds, and the hoopoe, and the bat. And all the teeming things with wings are unclean you. They shall not be eaten. Ah, but you may eat any clean flying insect. You shall not anything that dies of itself. You may give it to the alien who is in your town so that he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner. But you are a holy people to the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. This is the word of God. Please be seated. I can imagine what some of you were thinking <laughs> as the scripture was being read. Inwardly, you are saying, I came to the lecture this morning to get my batteries charged. I came for nourishment, for real meat. I don't need this gristle and sinew 
difficult to chew and of questionable dietary value. And how does this passage fit into our concern for this day to discover the gospel according to Moses and to learn how to preach this? If this is how you're feeling, have patience with me. I trust that by the end of this first hour together, you will actually be rejoicing over the profound theology that is waiting to be mined even from a text like this. I suppose when we look at a text like this, we should begin with a few general instructions on how should we read this text, or better, how should we hear it? And I've got a a few pointers. First, we need to read this passage not through the lens of contemporary and modern views of diet or culinary propriety, but in the light of ancient Near Eastern perceptions. This passage arises from a broader cultural context in which people lived in constant fear of offending the gods, even in things like eating food that could incur their wrath. Here is an excerpt from the prayer from ancient Mesopotamia. May the fury of my Lord's heart be quieted toward me. May the God whom I know or do not know be quieted toward me. O Lord, my transgressions are many, great are my sins. O my God, my transgressions are many, great are my sins. The transgressions that I have committed, I do not know. The sin that I have done, I do not know. The forbidden thing that I have eaten, I do not know. The prohibited place on which I set foot, indeed, I do not know. But the Lord, in the anger of his heart, looked at me. The God, in the rage of his heart, confronted me. When the goddess was angry with me, she made me become ill. What a pathetic piece. This person knows some God is angry, but doesn't know which God it is. He doesn't know what he has done to incur the wrath of the God, and he doesn't know what it'll take to fix it. These are the kinds of uncertainties that cause the nations around to look at the Israelites with such envy, Deuteronomy 4, 6 to 8, which we'll look at later. Wow, what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as this whole Torah that I am setting before you today? How privileged the Israelites were to know their God by name and to know exactly what pleased him. Rather than feeling sorry for the Israelites for being burdened with these picky laws, we should celebrate the greater the detail, even in the food laws, the clearer the boundaries, and I would argue, the greater the grace. Knowing boundaries can be very liberating. Those of you who have children know that. Second, We need to recognize the center of gravity in this passage. It's easy to become preoccupied with the prohibitions like Adam and Eve in the garden. Of all the trees in the garden you may eat except this one. And what did they do? They became so fixated on the one that they forgot everything that God had opened up for them. But so, in this text, as I was reading, did you notice how the categories of food are introduced? Verse 4, these are the animals you may eat, and then he gives a long list of acceptable fare. Verse 9, these are what you may eat of anything that's in the waters. Verse 11, all clean birds you may eat. And verse 20, all clean flying insects you may eat. Did you hear that? Rather than interpreting this passage as a hopeless list of legal proscriptions, we should see it as a wonderful affirmation of positive possibilities, like God's provision in Eden to eat of every tree. But we are preoccupied with the except. Third, we need to interpret this chapter in the light of all the other references to eating in the book of Deuteronomy. And there are lots of these. The most important in my mind comes in chapter 12. So, so now you may turn back your Bible, in your Bibles back a few pages to chapter 12, which offers us a wonderful text, God's magnanimous and magnificent 
invitation to worship. And in this passage, he gives the Israelites clear instructions of of what he expects or invites them to experience when they come to worship. So let's pick it up at uh, uh, verse 5. But you may seek the Lord at the place which the Lord your God will choose from all your tribes to establish his name as a dwelling, and there you may come. You may, you, you may bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, a contribution of your hand, your votive offerings, your free will offerings, the firstborn of your herd. There also you and your households may eat before the Lord your God and celebrate in all your undertakings in which the Lord your God has blessed you. And then he reiterates this all in verses 8 to 12. Look at verse uh, 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 verse 12, and you may celebrate before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants, the Levite in your gates, since he has no inheritance with you. This is worship Deuteronomy style. It's a call to celebrate and eat in the presence of a God. Are you aware that most sacrifices were not burned up, consumed completely on the altar? They were actually eaten in the presence of God. The Lord invites them, come, bring. Did you notice he doesn't say take? And he doesn't say go to the central sanctuary. He says come to the central sanctuary. Why? Because that's where God is. Bring your offerings. And when you bring your offerings, please, thank you, sit down, let me serve you. And God turns around and becomes the host of this, at this magnificent, magnificent occasion. At Sinai, the elders of Israel observed the glorious presence of God after concluding the covenant. And then the elders went up the mountain and they ate and drank in his presence. That's what eating together does. It celebrates fellowship, covenant, community, grace. Many Christians today think of Israelite worship as repetitive rituals performed by priests on behalf of bored worshipers who stood by passively observing the proceedings. But the picture in Deuteronomy is radically different. This is not to say that Deuteronomy has a full picture of Israelite worship. No, but it does offer a profound theology of worship. When Moses contemplated worship in the promised land, he muted not only the penitential and somber side of worship, and that is a somber and side, when we come confessing our sin. But it's about much more than that. Deuteronomy presents worship as the spontaneous response of believers to the Lord's invitation to fellowship, to banquet in his presence. Verbs for joy and celebration are rare in the context of worship texts in Leviticus and Exodus, but in Deuteronomy, they're all over the place. Come, rejoice. We never use that word in contemporary Canadian English anymore. And when we have the word rejoice here, we should read celebrate. That's what it means. That we get. God invites his people to a celebration. In these texts, Moses portrays the Lord as the divine host who invites his people to the meal in his presence. The people bring their offerings to him, and then he turns around and spreads the food out on the table for them. The remarkable feature of the regulation in this chapter is that the Lord serves his people precisely the kinds of food in which he himself delights at the sacrificial offerings. I don't know if you noticed that as I was reading. The Israelites' diet is linked directly to the sacrificial system. And this has implications for what we Christians do with that than later. But in this case, the kinds of food that God happily eats, it's a metaphor. He doesn't actually eat it. He says, come on, eat. So in a sense, every meal is a sacrifice, and every meal is a celebration of covenant. 
One more principle. We need to read the regulations about what you call these food laws. I don't call them the food laws. I call this God's invitation to the banquet. When we read this invitation, we need to read it, fourthly, in light of the preamble. I'm sure that by the time I was done reading in verse 21, you forgot completely how this text started. But look at verses 1 to 3. When we look at this, we grasp who is invited to this table. And when we've reflected on that, it all begins to make sense. What follows is a picture of the Lord's family gathered at his house for a banquet. When reading verses 1 to 3, we might get the impression that these are simply regulations for regulation's sake. But we discover that they are actually linked to our identity markers. Let's ask then, who is invited to this table? It's very interesting that the call to salvation in the Bible is unconditional without qualifications. But the call to worship is always conditioned. Pagans cannot worship properly. And the call to worship, read Psalm 24 and other texts, you'll see that. But here, what this call to fellowship is given to a particular group of people whose identity is marked. These days, we're doing a lot of, we're dis discussing the implications of DNA findings for human origins and whatever else is going on. We, are, we know that different species of animals have distinctive DNA. The giant panda is an ex interesting example, although the specific scientific name of the animal, Iluropoda melanoleuca, means black and white bear. Biologists were not sure whether the creature belonged to the raccoon or the bear family. How did they solve it? With DNA testing, and they discovered that the panda is not a bear. It's closer to the raccoon. Well, what's the DNA of those who are invited to this table? Let's imagine for a few moments that we are not only zoologists, interested in the taxonomies of the animals listed here, but scientists working on the Human Genome Project, trying to figure out the distinctive genes and the distinctive DNA patterns of the people of God. What answers to this agenda would our investigation yield? And if we look more closely, we discover a couple of clues that prove certain persons are not part of God's family. So let's look, first of all, at the external identity markers. Who may not eat at this table? I should say, who, and in so doing, we can say, who may eat of it? And I see three or four identity markers of those who are invited. First, the people in this family are distinguished by their appearance. They do not cut their bodies or shave their heads the way pagans do. What Moses has in mind here may be fleshed out by turning to Leviticus 19. Do not round off the side growth of your head. Do not clip off the side growth of your beard. Do not put gashes for the life of the dead on your body. And do not put tattoo cuts on yourself. I feel a sermon coming on. The point is, everything about us advertises our identity. There is a spiritual and theological significance to everything. In this context, the people in this family are distinguished by their appearance. Second, the members of this family are distinguished by their diet. Moses identifies three aspects of Canaanite diet that are taboo for Israelites. First, the family of God avoids abominable food. 
My translation is, you may not eat any detestable thing. That's a strong word, which is used elsewhere of the of how God feels about witchcraft, about murder, about idolatry. Here it's about food. From verses 4 to 5, it's clear that the Israelites are inv invited to eat all kinds of ruminants, animals that chew the cud and have split hoofs, but from the kinds of fowl and insects that are later mentioned here, and in Leviticus 11, another common denominator of acceptable foods uh, is that they are herbivores, the kinds of mammals, fish, birds, and insects that are rejected are those that may be either carnivores that kill animals for dinner or scavenging creatures that live off carrion, roadkill. In both cases, they're associated either with death or with filth, and therefore taboo. And that applies also to, this, to, to the insects, grasshoppers and Crickets are acceptable. Leviticus 11 spells it out. Uh, but why not the dung beetle? <laughs> Second, the members of God's family don't eat the meat of animals that they find that have died on their own without human, without human involvement. Verse 21, don't eat anything that dies by itself. Of course, he doesn't explain why. We know elsewhere that the blood has not been properly drained. The blood represents life, which is sacred, and you don't, you can sell this to the alien or give it to the alien, but you are a holy people. You don't eat blood. They don't eat meat of animals that have not been slaughtered in a kosher uh, butchery. Finally, the members of God, uh, the family of God don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. I wish I knew what that meant. Of course, this is the ground of the Jewish custom of not having milk and meat products in the same meal. Cheeseburger is a fundamental oxymoron. And if you go to Israel, you will see many places in the kibbutzim especially, they'll have, they may have two separate kitchens, one for doing milk products and one for doing meat products. So it comes from back to this. I doubt whether that's what he had in mind, but that's what the rabbis did with this one. And so it became the occasion for all kinds of uh, other picky laws. Well, these are the external markers. I, I suppose it's easy for us to take on these external markers and imagine that that's all there is to it. But as I read this passage, I discover, I get the, if, I, I, the feeling that somehow or other, while Moses has to distinguish his people from the others, they do represent a counterculture. It is not the externals that actually excites him. In fact, we need now to look at the internal DNA of the people of God. What separates the Israelites from the Canaanites? It's not just the externals. And I have a feeling now that this is why, this is where Moses really gets excited. And this is what excites me about this text. It's not its references to external markers, but the internal markers of the invitee. Did you notice as I was reading, the markers of those who are invited to this meal. First, the members of this family are all hand-picked by God. I've rearranged them in the logical order, not in the order in which they come. You are the sons of the Lord your God. You shall not eat of yourselves nor shave your head, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you to be his people. That's the first point. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, God has chosen these to come and eat in his presence. Not all are invited. 
This is not y'all come event or come as you are event. This is part of the picture of election that you find throughout the book of Deuteronomy. God chooses the place for his name to dwell. God chooses the Levites to stand and serve in his name. God chooses the king. But what is special in the emphasis is on, in, the, in the book is on God chooses Israel to be the object of his grace. The Lord has chosen you. It would be interesting to, uh, to study this in more detail, but 7-6, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God chose you to be a people, his treasured possession out of all the peoples on the face of the earth. Now, on what grounds did God choose Israel? It's very interesting to, to track that theme in the book of Deuteronomy. And we discover, for instance, in chapter 6, that it's not because Israel is so great, for you are the least among the peoples. In chapter 7, it is not because Israel is so talented. When you come into the land and, you, and, and you're enjoying that which you have produced, watch out that you don't say, see what my hands have produced. God brought us here because we, he knew we are good farmers. That's nothing to do with that. Or in chapter 9, the Lord is not giving you the land because you are more righteous than the Canaanites. No, 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 no. Ever since I have known you, you are a bunch of rebels. So it's not because of their superior righteousness. Then why does God choose Israel? The only answer Moses can give is because he loves Israel. Why does God love Israel? This is 7, 6, and 7. Because he loves Israel. And of course, that's exactly how it is with us. I'm a Gentile grafted into this family. How did God choose me? And of course, I do read the New Testament too, and I find lots of wonderful devotional material there. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 3 to 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Chosen. If we were chosen in Christ before the foundations of the world, our election obviously cannot have been based on any merit. No, the saving election of God is based entirely on his mysterious saving grace. Why I am standing before you this morning rather than my cousin with whom I shared a desk in a one-room country school in northern Saskatchewan, and with whom I shared a Sunday school class while we were growing up, and with whom we shared family gatherings at Grandma's house. Why am I here and not, and not him? I have no idea. I have no idea. It's not because of my superior righteousness. It's not because of my superior talent. It's not because I'm more significant, more important, obviously. It's a total mystery. How odd of God. I feel like Proverbs 31, the lizard in the king's palace. How did I get here? <laughs> it's actually a gecko. How does the, you know the gecko, you go to Florida, Texas, you see them all over the little, tiny little lizard. How does the gecko get to live in the king's palace? No idea. It's not his natural home. But here we are. Entrance into the family of God depends upon God's gracious election. Second, the member of this family are all adults. Adopted children of God. Do you see this? How it opens, the Hebrew here is very emphatic. Sons you are to the Lord your God. Really? How did that happen? 
Obviously, the Israelites are not sons of God in a literal sense like Jesus, the third member of the Trinity, or second, <laughs> a third member of the Trinity. Jesus is the Son of God in a very real sense, not just metaphorical sense, conceived by the Holy Spirit. Israel isn't naturally that. Well, if you're not naturally a son of God, how do you become that? We have two kids, the first of whom is adopted. He wasn't naturally ours. How did he become ours? By adoption. And that's what's happened here. Oh, the Lord has said several times in the book of Exodus... To Pharaoh, he said, Pharaoh, let my people go, my firstborn. And of course, the exodus is the act of Israel's birth. But they're not yet made the sons of God. What happens at Sinai is the formal adoption of Israel as his sons. This is suzerain vassal treaty metaphor language. The Israelites are the sons of God by adoption. They're naturally somebody else's kids. But at Sinai, he says, I will be your father and you will be my son. Now, we know that Sinai is also the, uh, becomes a metaphor for marriage. Israel is the Lord's bride. But we have two metaphors at work here. At Sinai, God says, I will be your father, you will be my son. Uh, this is the, it's, uh, the privilege the Israelites have of coming and eating into, in, in the presence of God is theirs by virtue of adoption. Paul recognizes this. When he says in Romans, they are Israelites. To them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the Torah, the worship, and the promises, the adoption. And this has become ours by grafting. And what a privilege. What a gracious God. And my friends, this is exactly the way it is with us. This is the DNA we share with the Israelites. Here again, the words of Paul in Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless in love. Covenant commitment. He predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Or Paul in Galatians 3.26, for in Christ you are all the sons of God through faith. Romans 8.15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you are re received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. What a glorious privilege. When the Lord invites us to his table, he invites us as members of his family. Like Israel, we were bound by slavery and death, but he rescued us. He brought us to himself. He adopted us as his children. If this doesn't excite you, my friends, we're in a coma. Wake up to the privilege of our standing with God. Third, the members of this family are all sanctified, set apart as his holy people. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. And we hear an echo of the same in verse 21. You are a holy people. This whole text is framed by these two phrases. You are a holy people. Do you know what that means? That means not simply to be awed, to be separate, to be set apart... In a sense, I can say this morning, I am holy vis-a-vis -vis you. I'm the only person on this platform, as far as I can tell, at the moment. Which means I'm set apart from the rest of you. No, 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 no. To be holy is always a profoundly religious word. Set apart for divine service. It's missional. At, in, in Genesis uh, or Exodus chapter 19, the Lord says to the, Israel, to the Israelites, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. 
Now then, if you will listen to my voice and keep my covenant, you'll be my special treasure, my royal priesthood, my holy nation. For all the peoples of the earth are mine. This is, this is the commissioning moment of Israel called to be agents of sanctification and blessing to the world. Missional, holy people set apart for divine service. In, in, in Israel, the high priest had on his forehead a medallion, gold medallion, engraved with the words, holy to the Lord. It's interesting what happens in Deuteronomy with that phrase. In Deuteronomy, half a dozen times, that phrase is applied to the whole people of Israel. It's not just the high priest. Holy to the Lord your God. Same inscription. We are branded with this. Commissioned to serve Him blamelessly and holily. Is there such an adverb? Fourth. The members of this family are elevated to the status of God's special treasure, a treasured people. The old King James Bible had, for you are a peculiar people. <laughs> well, in the 16th century, the word peculiar meant special. To us, it means odd, weird, strange. So... No, no, no. It means you are his treasured pe people. This word is used in the First Testament, my preferred reference. What you call something matters. In the First Testament, you find this word occurs only eight times. Six of them are metaphorical, as we have it here in our text, and in uh, Exodus 19, but two are literal. Here, 1 Chronicles 29, 3, and Ecclesiastes 2, 8. The word is used of valued possessions, especially the treasure. I gathered for myself, this is Ecclesiastes, silver and gold and the sigula of kings and provinces. I got singers, men and women, many concubines, the delight of the children. That's what it is. Sigula refers to the treasury of kings. Have you been to, anybody here been to the Tower of London? A few people seen the crown jewels there. <laughs> the first time I went. The second time we went, we had our grandkids, and we have an Ella who at that point was, a, she's a princess, and she imagines herself in that world. And when we went to the crown jewels with our grandkids, her eyes just went big. Wow. And I can just see the wheels turning. One day, I'm going to wear that. That's the word we're talking about. I, we mentioned before, I grew up in northern Saskatchewan. I'm just a farm kid, number nine of 15 kids, very poor family. I'm a, I'm a gecko in the king's palace. What am I doing here? I don't know. In any case, every spring before we put in the crop, we had to pick rocks. And the interesting thing is you pick rocks on the same hill every year. I, I was convinced that the devil spent the winter pushing up rocks. <laughs> now, there's no fun picking rocks. All you have at the, end of the big at the end of a day is a sore back and blisters on your hands and a rock pile. But let's imagine if those rocks were represented people. And now we've got a picture of the world. The world is a rock pile. Every rock represents, they're big rocks for China and the U.S. and Russia, and they're medium-sized rocks. Every nation is a rock in this rock pile. But they're just limestone rocks. Can you imagine what would happen if one day when we were out there on the field picking rocks, we see this brilliant sparkle over there, and we walk over, and we go and pick it up and say, woo, ah, it's, it's got to be quartz. I've seen hundreds of these, but it has a brilliance you never, so you take it to the jeweler, and you feel kind of stupid because what are the chances? And he looks at that, and he says, where did you find that? 
I said, I found her out picking the field. He said, that's a diamond. And I tell you, finding one diamond like that would make the whole spring of rock picking worth it. <laughs> diamond. That's what we are. 1 Peter 2.9, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were nobodies, but now you are somebody. You're the people of God. You are his diamonds. Have you ever noticed that diamonds are actually only rocks? They don't do anything. They're totally passive. They don't give off light, but they sparkle, don't they? Which is why it's important to keep a diamond clean, because if it gets dirty, it doesn't sparkle anymore. But what's the function of a diamond? To reflect somebody else's light. Whose light in this case? The Lord's light. This is why the Israelites, uh, the king is sometimes called the signet of the Lord. He's the supreme reflection of the Lord's grace. Diamonds. There are some images from my childhood that I will never forget. Among these is the image of my mother. And of course, we had 13 surviving kids, one girl and 12 boys. <clears throat> my father used to say, I have six and a half dozen boys and each has one sister. <laughs> and she lived here in St. Catharines until her decease a few years ago now. She was number three, probably the worst place to be if you're the only girl. In any case, my mother patched a lot of pants. We were very poor, poorest in the neighborhood, and so couldn't afford new pants. You kept reworking old ones. And she'd patch the pants, and as she was sitting at, I'm too young to have this memory, but as she'd be sitting at that treadle sewing machine, her foot would be going up and down, up and down, she'd always sing. I remember my mother singing, and here's a song she would sing. Some of you may remember. When he cometh, when he cometh to make up his jewels, all his jewels, precious jewels, his loved and his own, like the stars of the morning, his bright crown adorning, they shall shine in their beauty, bright gems for his crown. He will gather, he will gather the gems for his kingdom, all the pure ones, all the bright ones, his loved and his own, like the stars of the morning, his bright crown adorning, they shall shine in their beauty bright gems for his crown little children little children who love their redeemer are the jewels precious jewels his loved and his own like the stars of the morning his bright crown adorning they shall shine in their beauty, bright gems for his crown. <laughs> I used to think that was a kid's song. Not anymore. That's my song. That's who we are. It reminds us all of our status and our mission. In the words of Peter, you're a people for his own possession that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's great, brilliant commentary on this strange little word, segola. This is who we are. Well, I don't know where this leaves you this morning. Perhaps to some of us this is just antiquarian stuff, boring and puts me to sleep. I pray it's not. 
But unless we grasp the sense of privilege the Israelites should have felt at being called the children of God, at being chosen out of all the nations, at being set apart as his missional people, at being polished as his crown jewels, we will never grasp the privilege that has been granted to us Gentiles grafted into this tree. My friends, we are God's people. Not because of any merit of our own, not but because of the amazing grace that He has lavished on us. We are invited to this table. Come, eat in the presence of the Lord. Celebrate. Away with feelings and feeling sorry for yourself. I wish I weren't a Christian. Life would be so much more exciting. No. Join the celebration at the table. God invites us. The good shepherd has indeed. So Psalm 23. It's ringing in my ears as I read this text. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows. You anoint my. This is a celebration. Surely goodness, the hounds of heaven, goodness and mercy will hound me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a gospel. It's fascinating. It is fascinating to observe what happens to this motif of the banquet in the presence of the Lord. But then it's also fascinating to see what happens in the New Testament. Did you ever notice? When Jesus transforms the annual Israelite Passover into the regular communion meal, and when he institutes the Lord's Supper, he is God in the flesh, inviting redeemed sinners, children of God, his holy people, his chosen ones, his disciples, his special treasure, to eat in his presence. However, in contrast to First Testament communion in which the worshiper brought the sacrifice and then the Lord turned around and invited the family to sit down and eat after blessing the bread. Jesus, the divine host, broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said, take eat. This is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, drink of it all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness, forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not eat or drink, uh, drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Isn't that amazing? The Lord invites us to his table and then he offers himself. Eat of me. Through him, our admission to the family of God is secured. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Amen.